Hello viewers. Welcome to this series of lectures on spectroscopy. Uh, today, in our second part of uh, vibration spectrometry or spectroscopy, uh, I will be talking to you about the nature of spectrum and polyatomic molecules. Basically, we will try to build on what we did earlier and try to continue from there. And uh, as usual, our session is planned as follows. To begin with, I will try to give you a review of what we did in the previous session, so that we know the foundations of this. And then thereafter, I will talk about the nature of spectrum from an harmonic oscillator model. Because basically, in the previous session, we worked in detail about the harmonic oscillator. And then we did introduce something on an harmonicity and a harmonic oscillator, but we have to talk about the nature of spectrum which comes from there. Thereafter, we will see that uh, if I extend my argument from a diatomic molecule to polyatomic molecules, what kind of things happen there. So, how do we talk about the different possible modes of vibrations for polyatomic molecule and what kind of spectra do we expect from there. While we we'll talk about uh, the vibrational modes of polyatomic molecules, we will try to see how do we calculate the vibrational modes for a given polyatomic molecule depending on uh, the number of atoms it has and also we will try to see how do we ascertain whether a given mode of vibration is uh, uh, vibrationally active or not or in other words uh, it is IR active or not whether it is going to absorb IR radiation or not that is what we are going to do there. And then uh, we will see that uh, despite all this we will find that the actual spectrum which we get uh, is much more complicated. So, uh, where do this additional vibration band come from? So, we will try to play, explain the origin of such additional bands over there. And towards the end, we will try to sum up what we do today. Okay. So, let us make a beginning by quickly recalling what we did in the previous session. We started with discussing the how do we model molecular vibration. That means, we started with talking about a harmonic oscillator. And in the process, we stated and analyzed the results of quantum mechanical treatment of a harmonic oscillator, uh, wherein we got an energy expression. and uh, the corresponding energy level diagram, the, uh, the uh, kind of uh, selection rule, nature of spectrum, thought all we covered in the last session. Then we also showed towards the end that this harmonic oscillator model is inadequate because it does not truly represent uh, the oscillatory behavior of a diatomic molecule because our molecule is not uh, harmonic because if it is harmonic, it is not going to dissociate, which it does. So, we have to bring in some kind of an harmonicity and that uh, if you consider an harmonic model whereby uh, instead of taking uh, our uh, kind of a parabolic kind of a uh, potential energy uh, expression, we used most potential and we realized that by doing that uh, our energy expression changes, and the energy level diagram changes, the selection rule changes and uh, the number of expressions which were different from what we had in case of harmonic oscillator. So, we compared these two things. That means, what kind of expressions we get in harmonic oscillator and an harmonic oscillator, what is its significance. So, uh, let us see, let us try to recall uh, that when we considered a harmonic oscillator, what kind of energy level diagram we had. You remember that we had series of energy levels which are equally spaced. The first one V is equal to 0 level was at half omega oscillation and this was at 3 by 2, 5 by 2, 7 by 2, 9 by 2, 11 by 2 and so on and so forth. That means, they are equally spaced. And also, we had that our vibrational quantum number changes by one unit as a selection rule, which led to a spectrum which consisted of only a single line. So, that is the kind of thing we observed if we consider a molecule to be behaving like a harmonic oscillator. Thereafter, uh, when we moved on to a harmonic oscillator by considering most potential, we realized that there are a lot of changes happening there. And the two things which I want to bring home again, uh, the two significant things are that Firstly, our energy level diagram becomes different, the energy levels are not equally spaced as before, they get closer and closer as V goes higher, that is one. And secondly, what we had was that our selection rule now becomes different, it becomes that delta V is equal to plus minus 1, plus minus 2, plus minus 3 and so on and so forth. That is, the vibration quantum number can change by any magnitude, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, any number of units, that means there are, what we expect is a large number of bands or signals are expected here, if I am considering an harmonic oscillator. That means, I am expecting uh, the spectrum of a molecule to be highly complicated because there are so many signals I am expecting. But, what actually happens is uh, formally when you do an experiment, we find that we observe only a few 
uh, such transitions there. Let us see what do we normally uh, observe for a diatomic molecule. We find that there are three kind of things which are uh, likely to be observed. The first one is called as a fundamental that means the transition uh, from v is equal to 0 to v is equal to 1 level is called as a fundamental vibration that is observed very significantly. In addition to that we have something called as first overtone which corresponds to transition v is equal to 0 to v is equal to 2 level and a second overtone from v is equal to 0 to v is equal to 3 level. Now, why so? The reason for that is because what we just said that vibration quantum number can change by any amount that is one and second energy levels are uh, slightly differently placed now. What happens is though the transitions in principle can change that means, uh, selection rule permits uh, transition of high uh, delta V changes, but what happens is what is found is that uh, the transition probability for such kind of transition happens to be very poor that means, uh, maybe it is very close to 0 that means, though their the selection rule permits their happening, but they are not observed because our transition probabilities are very low that is one reason. And secondly uh, as we know that we mentioned in earlier uh, sessions here that is our vibration energy levels are far apart and if I apply Boltzmann distribution uh, uh, kind of equation we find that that for most of the system the molecules will be in V is equal to 0 level. The population of V is equal to 1 will be very very small as compared to V is equal to 0 level. For all practical purposes we can say it is uh, not populated at all, be the population is so very low. That means, effectively all transitions will be originating from V is equal to 0 level. So, that means, we will have V is equal to 0 to 1, 0 to 2, 0 to 3 and 0 to 4 probably will not be observed because the transition probability will become close to 0. So, primarily I am expecting 3 signals over there. Let us take this expression further and see how do we locate where are these bands going to come because we know that position of a band in the spectrum has to be uh, determined by the energy level difference. So, if we look at V is equal to 0 to V is equal to 1 level uh, what I can do is I can find the delta E for this by taking energy of V is equal to 1 level and subtract from this the energy of V is equal to 0 level. When I do that I find the expression comes out to be omega e 1 minus 2 x e. So, that means, this is the location that means, omega e 1 minus 2 x e is the location of my fundamental. We will talk more about it as we proceed. As regards that if I look into first overtone, first overtone was when I have transition from v is equal to 0 to v is equal to 2 level. When I do that, do a similar exercise that means, e v 2 v, uh, v is equal to 2 minus e v equal to 0. If I do this, I find it comes out that 2 omega e 1 minus 3 x e. Similarly, the second overtone will come at uh, 3 omega e 1 minus 4 x e. So, they are the places where do I expect these signals to appear in the spectrum. Let us look at a spectrum. This is an IR spectrum of carbon monoxide a simple molecule. What you find is the fundamental observation that means, this V is equal to 0 to 1 level transition is observed at 2 1 4 3 centimeter inverse this fine structure is because of rotation we will talk uh, maybe it is not part of our curriculum, but this is just basically because of uh, the simultaneous rotational uh, transitions accompanying the vibration uh, transition. And what is what I wanted to bring home here the context here is that this fundamental vibration is observed and we also have what is a first overtone which is located at 4 to 6 0 centimeter inverse. We find that the first overtone is uh, located at a frequency slightly less than double that means, overtone is not double the frequency it is slightly less than that and the reason for that uh, you can rationalize in terms of the energy expression we know that as the levels go up. So, 0 level, 1 level, 2 level. So, 1 level is slightly less than what was there in the harmonic oscillator case 2 is still less than that. So, they get closer and closer. So, it is not double that means, v, to go, v is equal to 0 to 2 level transition is not double of 0 to 1 it is slightly less than that okay, because that x c v term will come into picture. So, that is a kind of a, an experimental observation we have with us. Let us move further one more thing which is uh, probably uh, needs to be taken note of is that as I just mentioned uh, that uh, the population of energy levels is not significant beyond v is equal to 0 level, but if uh, I give some term amount of energy or maybe I can do the measurement at high temperature. When I do it at a higher temperature what happens is that V is equal to 1 level becomes significantly populated 
and what we can have is we can have transitions say v is equal to 1 to v is equal to 2 level because they were otherwise not observed but now because at high temperature v is equal to 1 level becomes reasonably populated and then we can think of a possible transition from v is equal to 1 to 2 and such a transition will be located at if we just do the same exercise v is equal to 2 minus e v is equal to 1 if i do that i find it is located at omega e 1 minus 4 xc such bands which are observed at high temperature are called as hot bands this is very important observation because this uh, is something which we need to know of okay we have already done is we have seen that if i consider a molecule to be behaving as a an harmonic oscillator so what kind of spectrum we getting where do the uh, what is the location of different signals i am expecting there this is all we have talked about in the context of a diatomic molecule now if i have a polyatomic molecule a larger molecule say carbon dioxide water benzene cyclohexane you take any molecule we think of so in such cases what kind of spectra do we expect what are different vibrational modes there because a diatomic molecule is only by default there is only single vibration possible that's all it can vibrate only in one way nothing else but if i go to the polyatomic system then there are many more vibrations possible there so a polyatomic molecule executes a number of vibrations since it has got number of bonds so this vibrate in wide variety of ways i will not get into details of how do they vibrate but i will try to see that how do i compute how many modes of vibrations are there for a given polyatomic molecule let's look at that now to make a case for that uh, let's i ju just meet us talk about so i got a simple molecule a top polyatomic molecule and let me see that how many possible degrees of freedom it has in general any molecule having n atoms have 3 n degrees of freedom that means Uh, if an, a molecule has got three atoms, I need at least there are nine degrees of freedom the molecule can have. Okay, so that is the meaning of the statement here. Now, out of these three uh, degrees are used for translatory motion because someone talking about a molecule here, a molecule can be here, here it has to, it can move in uh, anywhere in the three-dimensional space. So it can move along x-axis, along y-axis, along z-axis, or anywhere in between. So I need three degrees of freedom to ascribe or to describe. the translatory motion of the molecule so out of 3 n three modes of vibrations are used for uh, translation okay so these three degrees we can see it like this so what you have is you have got a, a triatomic molecule more than two atoms is polyatomic molecule no this molecule can move along x axis along y axis or along z axis so i need three degrees of freedom to be used for describing the translatory motion so i'm left with 3n minus 3 degrees uh, which can be used to uh, describe the rotational and vibrational motion of the molecule so, okay so total are 3n 3 go for translatory motion out of 3n minus 3 let's see what happens there now the number of degrees of freedom for rotational motion or rotational modes of, will depend on the nature of the molecule okay for example if i look at a linear molecule a linear molecule has only two rotational degrees of freedom that means it can rotate only in two possible ways which make changes let's see now if you look at a molecule of this kind a linear molecule is a diatomic molecule you could take a triatomic molecule or any larger molecule you can think of now if it's a linear molecule that's important is the linear part of it this can rotate in two possible ways one around y axis one around z axis and any motion along x axis It doesn't cause any change. Let me just uh, explain to you. Now, if I look at, so let me just take this pen as an example. Let me think it to be a linear molecule. This linear molecule has got some atom one, atom two, atom three. Let me take carbon dioxide. It is carbon here, oxygen here, oxygen here. Now, suppose this molecule carbon dioxide ro rotates like this. This doesn't cause any change. This rotation is insignificant. As against that, the second possibility is. it can rotate like this that means this molecule is coming towards you then going away that that's one motion here that means if i'm looking at this is a plane of the molecule this is perpendicular to the plane of the molecule that is along y axis as shown in the diagram here and second possibility is that this molecule can rotate like this in the plane of the molecule by itself okay so if i do like this this again is a possible mode of rotation here so any linear molecule will need have two degrees of rotational motion rotational modes of 
uh, are required for that. As against that, if I have got a nonlinear molecule, now this can have this needs three rotational degrees of freedom along x axis, along y or z, it can move around all possible axes. So, that is the basic difference here. But what is the consequence of that? The consequence of that is we had a total of 3 and minus 3 degrees of freedom. If the molecule is linear, so 2 go for rotational motion. If it is non-linear, 3 go for rotational motion. So, uh, if I have got a no non-linear molecule, in such cases, we need 6 degrees of freedom for rotational and translation. Let us try to have a look at it. Now, suppose I have got a non-linear molecule. So, this needs 3 motion, 3 degrees for translatory motion, say along x axis, along y axis, along z axis. And also, there are 3 rotational modes there, one around x axis, one around y axis, one around z axis. So, there are total of 6 degrees of freedom which are used for rotational and translatory motion for a non-linear molecule, it could be any atomicity. Now, so we are left with 3 n minus 3 minus 2 or 3 n minus 5 degrees of freedom for a linear molecule and 3 n minus 3 minus 3 or in other words we can say 3 n minus 6 degrees of freedom for a non-linear molecule. So, and these are the ones which are vibrational degrees of freedom. That means, if a molecule is linear it can have 3 n minus 5 degrees of freedom for the vibrational motion. Nonlinear molecule will have 3 n minus 6 degrees of freedom. Let us take some examples. Let me, uh, okay, before I take examples, let me quickly just give a summary of this. So, if I, uh, if I nature of molecule is linear or nonlinear, translatory motion are 3 each, rotational 2 for linear, 3 for nonlinear, vibrational 3 n minus 5 here, 3 n minus 5, 6 here and total is 3 n which we just started with. Okay. So, that is the kind of degrees of freedom we have for a given molecule. Now, let me take an example. How do I calculate the vibration degrees of freedom for a given molecule? Let me take the first case, a triatomic linear molecule say um, A B 2, an example could be carbon dioxide. Now, if you look at carbon dioxide molecule, so this is my carbon atom, there are two oxygen atoms here. So, n is equal to 3, shape is linear. So, the number of vibration degrees of mode will be uh, 3 minus 3 into 3 minus 5 that is 9 minus 5 that gives me 4. So, carbon dioxide can have 4 vibrational degrees of freedom or 5 vibrational modes of uh, 4 vibrational modes. Okay. Now, let us see what they are. So, the 4 vibrational modes of carbon dioxide are as follows. One is asymmetric stretching. Now, uh, let me explain what are these modes. Let me first take a symmetric stretching this one here. This is very simple. What it says is, now suppose I am looking at a carbon dioxide molecule. This is carbon atom, this is one oxygen, this is another oxygen. Just imagine carbon to be somewhere here. Okay. Now, what happens is, the symmetric stretching means, this is my carbon oxygen bond, this is carbon oxygen bond. So, these two bonds are there. Now, suppose it so happens, it vibrates in this fashion. That means, there is a simultaneously stretching or contraction, stretching, contraction they happen simultaneously. This is a symmetric stretching. Okay. This is one mode of vibration. Second mode of vibration, the one I have mentioned earlier that is asymmetric, anti-symmetric uh, mode of vibration. In this case, what happens is again same molecule, this is my carbon here, there are two oxygens. It so happens that this bond is vibrating, uh, that it is stretching, this is contracting. So, that is the kind of motion we have. Okay. When this expands, this contracts. Okay. I repeat. So, you have molecule like this, First motion was this simple one, both are stretching, both are contracting. In second case, this is stretching, this is contracting, this is stretching, this is contracting. So, this bond stretches, this bond contracts. There is a second mode of vibration called an anti-symmetric mode of vibration. The third and fourth, there are two bending modes and one bending mode is, uh, say this one is of easier one, this is bending in the plane of the paper as shown over there. So, this is my molecule of carbon dioxide, carbon, two oxygen again. So, that is the bending mode. So, this is the starting point, this bends like this, comes back, goes up, comes back, it is in the plane, that is in plane bending. Second possibility could be, that is called as a out of plane bending, that is this kind of a thing. You have again the same molecule, this happens like this. That means, it bends in a direction perpendicular to its molecular plane. Okay. So, there are four vibrational modes for carbon dioxide. Let us see which mode is going to be IR active because we have to 
see that uh, out of the different modes there, how many modes, all the modes may not be IR active. So, we have to see which modes of vibration is going to absorb IR radiation. Asymmetric stretching mode of vibration, we find there, now suppose look at this molecule, this is my carbon dioxide, normal molecule there. In this case, what happens is, this bond has got con uh, compressed, this has got stretched. Again, the normal one here, so this is, this bond is compressing, this is stretching. So, this is asymmetric mode of vibration. So, in this case, to, be, to begin with, a normal molecular carbon dioxide has no dipole moment, but the moment you have got this kind of a scenario, I mean this bond becomes larger than this one. So, the magnitude of dipole moment becomes different in two bonds and it does not cancel out. So, there is a net dipole moment there. That means, when a carbon dioxide molecule executes asymmetric stretching mode, it will lead to changing dipole and that will be an IR active mode. That means, this molecule, molecule vibrating in this particular way is going to absorb IR radiation or is IR active. Now, if you look at symmetric stretching, so that is my normal mole molecule here. So, this is contracting, further contracting, expanding, further expanding, but it is happening is both the bonds are contracting or expanding in the same way. So, in none of these orientations, the molecule has got any dipole moment. So, since there is no dipole moment, this mode is IR inactive. If you move to uh, the vibration modes which are of bending nature, so this is in plane bending. So, this is a molecule here, if it bends like this, the dipole moment will be there because now in this case, since they are opposite to each directionally opposite, diagonally opposite, they are cancelling out. They do not cancel out here. So, there is a net dipole here. Here they are cancelling, here they do not. Okay. So, as this molecule vibrates in a bending, it executes a bending mode, there will be a changing dipole and that will lead to uh, IR activity. Similarly, if I look at uh, the out of plane bending, so that means this plus means the atom is coming towards me, minus means going away from me. So, that is the kind of mode I am talking about. So, here again as in the previous case, this also is a IR active mode. So, to just sum up what we have is, so we have got four modes of vibration for carbon dioxide, three of them happen to be IR active, one happens to be IR inactive. That means, this mode of vibration will not be observed. That means, if I look at the spectrum of carbon dioxide, I will be seeing this signal, I will be seeing signal because of this, I will be seeing signal because of this, this will not be observed. So, that is the meaning of uh, to there is a significance of talking about different vibrational modes of for a given molecule. Let me take another example. Let me take second case, I have a triatomic molecule which is not linear, say water molecule. If I look at water molecule, I find that again uh, n is equal to 3, but shape happens to be nonlinear, and that gives me uh, using the formula my degrees of freedom happen to be just 3. So, that means a water molecule can execute only 3 modes of vibration. And Incidentally, all the three modes of vibration happen to be IR active. So, you can just uh, look at this, this is symmetric stretching, asymmetric stretching and this is bending mode. So, they are very, very obvious here. So, in each one of these modes, there will be a change in dipole. So, all the three are IR active. So, this we can continue with, we can take any example, try to work out how many modes are there and then try to see that when you execute that mode of vibration, uh, does it lead to any change in dipole moment or not. If it does, it is IR active, it does not, it is not, it is as simple as this. Now, thus we can say that if I look at a spectra of a molecule containing n atoms, it is expected to have signals, the fundamentals and the corresponding overtones for all the identified modes of vibration. That means, say for water molecule, so I would expect three signals for the three modes of vibration and also the, there will be corresponding overtones there, first overtone, second overtone, so there will be number of signals will be expected there. And larger the molecule, greater will be the number of bands. Obviously, there will be no more number of vibrations there, so there will be more signals there. That means, the spectra is going to be quite complicated one. And let me just show you a typical IR spectrum of a substance taken in solution phase. What I find is that the number of signals I am observing here are much more than what I expect for a simple, this is a simple molecule, uh, this is a spectra of a very simple molecule and the number of signals I am getting here are much more than what is predicted by the argument we have been giving so far. So, what is the reason for this? The reason for that is that in addition to uh, what we have just talked about the fundamental, the first overtone, the second overtone, what we have is there are many more bands which come up there and some of these happen to be say a combination band. So, what happens is the frequency of such a band is the sum of two interacting bands there. That means, you may have say, suppose there are two 
uh, fundamentals say nu1 and nu2 or v1 or nu1 and nu2 so you can have a band coming at nu1 plus nu2 so that is a combination band or maybe we can think of a difference band as well there is a possibility they are observed that is the frequency of such a band will be the difference of two interacting bands that means the new difference will be equal to nu1 minus nu2 suppose there are two bands there say one is fundamental one fundamental two so fundamental one plus fundamental two whatever the number comes out to be i can expect a signal there that's called as a combination band or you can expect a signal at the difference uh, of the two values there in addition to that sometimes we do observe what is called as a fermi resonance signal this is an interesting observation because in some cases we do come across this what happens is that you have number of vibration modes for a given molecule there is one fundamental vibration mode and near in the very neighborhood of that the, you may have you know overtone of some other fundamental there let me suppose a fundamental is at say uh, 800 okay so its overtone is expected to be somewhere around uh, 1590 1595 and suppose there is a another fundamental at say 1600 so this 1595 which is an overtone of the another band there and 1600 which happens to be a new fundamental there so these two bands can interact and when the two bands interact they lead to Uh, signals which are beyond these two because uh, one signal becomes larger one becomes smaller there are many more things there which are beyond our uh, this level of uh, transaction we are doing there but what's important to know is that in such cases also we get additional band there so so what i expect now what do i expect is uh, that the spectrum which i get when i'm doing uh, an ir spectrum or a, a vibration measurement there the spectrum will be quite complicated and uh, It, it becomes very difficult to interpret each and every signal i observe there okay so in such cases uh, we will be talking about this at a later stage that is uh, how do i make sense of the kind of spectra i get in the uh, the ir spectrum i get so that means what is the significance of each one of them we'll try to do that maybe in the next session there let's sum up what we did today what we did today is we started with uh, recalling what we did in the previous session wherein we talked about uh, what is vibration spectroscopy uh, we talked about uh, how do i consider a, a, a vibrating diatomic molecule to be behaving as a harmonic oscillator and things like that let me what kind of energy expression i get what is the energy level diagram what kind of selection rules are there what spectra does come out of there so i mean we have been recalled that we moved on to uh, the spectrum expected from based on the an harmonic oscillator model that means if i consider the molecular vibration to be of an harmonic nature what kind of spectra do we expect that's the starting point for our today's session thereafter we formulated expressions this was very important here that is if i have a polyatomic molecule what are possible modes of vibrations are there uh, that means and i we worked out that for a molecule which is linear there are 3 and minus 5 degrees of freedom which are for vibrational modes and for a nonlinear molecule it is 3 and minus 6 so the, on the base of this we computed calculated the number of modes uh, the vibrational modes for some of the molecules like carbon dioxide water and we did work out uh, we ascertained their ir activity for this to be done what we did was we, uh, we tried to uh, look at uh, each individually each vibrational mode and saw whether does it lead to any uh, development of uh, oscillatory dipole moment or not if it does it happens to be ir active if it doesn't it is ir inactive and then thereafter uh, we explained the origin of additional bands in the polyatomic spectrum uh, spectra uh, because what happens is that we found that uh, though uh, our uh, an harmonic oscillator allows uh, a large number of transitions to be there but they are not observed because the transition probabilities are very poor or uh, the population is very low so in such cases we expect a fewer number of signals to be there what we actually observe is much larger than that so that actually happens to be because of additional bands which are like combination band difference band of fermi resonance uh, etc so so we did explain how does do come into picture there having done all this uh, in the next session we will now try to see uh, as i just mentioned some time back that how do i make sense of Uh, the spectra i get there that means if i have ir spectrum how do i interpret that w- what does it convey to me that means if i have a signal at certain places what does it mean to me so that all i'll take up in the next session thank you